<clears throat> After hearing you testify that Almighty God does the work of judgment in the last days, I searched through the Bible and I found more than 200 verses prophesy God's work of judgment. You say God comes to do the judgment work of the last days, which is more than backed up by the Bible. But I've got a question. God used Moses to do the work of the age of law. Why then is the work of judgment done by God incarnate personally rather than using man to do it? That's right. In the age of grace, the Lord Jesus became flesh for the sake of crucifixion to save man. That work must be done by God incarnate and can't be replaced by man. Then, why does God do the work of judgment in the last days by incarnation? Can't it be done by man as God did it way back in the age of law? Why is it God's work of judgment in the last days has to be done by God incarnate instead of being done by the man used by God? You ask a very good question. This question is crucial, involving whether man can be raptured before God's throne or whether they can be saved and then enter into the kingdom of heaven. An important question. Almighty God has said many words in answer to this. Let's look at some of the words of Almighty God. Turn to page 44. The work of judgment is God's own work, so it must naturally be done by God himself. It cannot be done by man in his stead. Because judgment is the conquering of man through the truth, it is unquestionable that God still appears as the incarnate image to do this work among men. That is to say, in the last days, Christ shall use the truth to teach men around the earth and to make all truths known to them. This is God's work of judgment. In the last days, Christ uses a variety of truths to teach man, reveal the essence of man, and dissect his words and deeds. These words comprise various truths, such as man's duty, how man should obey God, how man should be loyal to God, how man ought to live out the normal humanity, as well as the wisdom and disposition of God, and so on. These words are all focused on the essence of man and his corrupt disposition. In particular, those words that reveal how man spurns God are spoken in regards to how man is an embodiment of Satan and an enemy force against God. When God does the work of judgment, he does not simply make clear the nature of man with just a few words, but reveals, deals with, and prunes over the long term. Such manner of revelation, dealing, and pruning cannot be substituted with ordinary words, but with the truth that man does not possess at all. Only such manner of work is deemed judgment. Only through such judgment can man be persuaded, be thoroughly convinced into submission to God, and gain true knowledge of God. What the work of judgment brings about is man's understanding of the true face of God and the truth about his rebelliousness. The work of judgment allows man to gain much understanding of the will of God, of the purpose of God's work, and of the mysteries that could not be understood by man. It also allows man to recognize and know his corrupt substance and the roots of his corruption, as well as to discover the ugliness of man. These effects are all brought about by the work of judgment, for the substance of such work is actually the work of opening up the truth, way, and life of God to all those who have faith in Him. This work is the work of judgment done by God. No one is more suitable and qualified than God in the flesh. For the work of judging the corruption of man's flesh, Satan can only be fully defeated if God in the flesh judges the corruption of mankind. Being the same as man possessed of normal humanity, 
God in the flesh can directly judge the unrighteousness of man. This is the mark of his innate holiness and of his extraordinariness. Only God is qualified to and in the position to judge man. For he is possessed of the truth and righteousness, and so he is able to judge man. Those who are without the truth and righteousness are not fit to judge others. Only because of these judgments do you see that God is a righteous God, that God is a holy God. Only because of his holiness and his righteousness does he judge you and pour wrath upon you that he can reveal his righteous disposition when seeing man's disobedience and his holiness when seeing man's filthiness, shows that he is God himself, holy and unblemished despite living in a land of filth. If a man wallows in the mire with others, without holiness or righteous disposition, he would be unqualified to judge others' unrighteousness or make any other judgment upon them. If a man judges others, does he not strike his own face? How can a man who is unclean be qualified to judge others who are also unclean? Only God himself, who is holy, can judge the impure mankind. How can man judge others' sin? How can man see others' sin and be qualified to condemn others? If God were unqualified to judge man's sins, how could he be the righteous God himself? When man displays his corrupt disposition, God speaks and judges you, and in this way you see that he is holy. Almighty God has told us clearly the significance of God incarnate doing the work of judgment in the last days. In the last days, God does the work of judgment by expressing the truth, God's righteous disposition, and God's almightiness and wisdom to reveal and judge the satanic nature of corrupt mankind and to save mankind from Satan's influence and transform man's life disposition and to perfect man so they gain the truth, come to know God, and then live out a meaningful life. And such work as saving and perfecting man must be done by none other than God incarnate personally, because mankind of the last days are full of satanic disposition, self-conceited and arrogant, crooked and crafty, selfish and base. They have become Satan's descendants and lost their conscience, reason, integrity, and dignity, like animals without spirits at all, not having much likeness of a man. To save such an extremely corrupt mankind, God must be incarnated to express His words directly and express His righteous, majestic, and wrathful disposition to judge man, conquer man, and purify man, so that mankind will hear the voice of God and see God's disposition and witness His wrath as well. Thus, the corrupt mankind can be thoroughly conquered and defeated. They will fall on the ground, fear God, obey God, and shun evil. That is the result achieved by God incarnate in doing the work of judgment. You see, God incarnate not merely expresses God's words, but most importantly, He allows mankind to see God's appearance and disposition, the deeds of God, the almightiness of God, and His wisdom as well. And they'll see that God's tabernacle is among man. God lives with man. And man lives before God while communicating with God and speaking to him directly. All of that is indeed fulfilled by God incarnate. That is, the true meaning of God's doing the work of judgment by incarnation. All those who have experienced God's work of judgment in the last days can bear witness to these facts. It's so meaningful for God incarnate to do the work of judgment in the last days. I'm still not very clear at all. Since God used the prophets to convey all the words of God, well then, in the last days, God can also use man to convey his word in doing the judgment work. Am I not right about it? 
Many people just can't perceive why God doesn't choose to use man to do the work of judgment in the last days, mainly because man's substance is corrupt with satanic disposition. Even if they are perfected and directed by the Holy Spirit, they are unworthy of expressing God's words, even less expressing God's disposition. His almightiness and His wisdom are what God has and is. Since the man used by God is humanity in substance with no divinity, he isn't qualified to work in God's identity. Whatever he says or does can't represent God, so he can't do the work of saving mankind. For example, God used Moses to do the work of the age of law. Moses himself could convey God's words just like one of the prophets does. So, why did he not dare to speak in God's stead then? Because he was a man, and he wasn't God incarnate. That is the substantial difference between God incarnate and the man used by God. Some of you asked, since God used Moses in the age of law, why doesn't God then use man to do the work of judgment once again here in the last days? There's a special background for God to use Moses to do the work of the age of law. People in the age of law were shallowly corrupted, and the work of the age of law was not to transform man's disposition, but to issue commandments, statutes, and ordinances to lead mankind's life. God used Moses mainly to issue commandments, statutes, and ordinances to tell man how to obey Jehovah's laws and commandments and the principles necessary for man's life and let man know how to live before God and how to worship God, thus leading the newborn mankind to live on earth. Therefore, we could know his work could be fulfilled by using Moses. Obviously, whether God does his work by incarnation or by using man in any given age is according to the management plan of God and the need of corrupt mankind. The redemptive work in the age of grace and the judgment work in the last days are the work of opening an age and of ending one, and they are the work of redeeming and saving mankind. But this absolutely must be done by God incarnate and can't be done by anyone instead. Almighty God's word is so very clear. The end time work is for God to express the truth in his righteous disposition so as to judge man, purify, and save man. This kind of work can only be done by God incarnate. Man is not God incarnate or truth. He can't do God's work of judgment in the last days. It makes so much sense. Yes, it does. Now I understand God's work can only be done by God and God himself, and not by just anyone.